Stargazing has been a pastime for the entirety of human history. From Central European cavemen, ancient Chinese, Babylonians, Vikings, North American Inuits, all the way to modern day astronomers, they all have been fascinated by nature's light show called the Aurora Borealis. In this video, we'll explore how people of all historic ages have perceived the dancing lights, our current understanding of the science behind the phenomenon, and what you need to do if you want to see northern lights with your own eyes. Chapter 1. The History of the Aurora Borealis Over 30,000 years ago, long before civilizations emerged, auroral lights have illuminated the night sky, and the cavemen in today's France were so fascinated by the spectacle that the scene was immortalized in the cave painting Macaronis. Throughout human history, references to auroral lights can be found in numerous cultures in the form of tales, carvings and texts, many of them also pondering about the origin of this strange sight. Today we know that the auroral lights are most common near the North and South Pole, so it's no surprise that cultures closer to the poles have seen numerous shows and countless stories have emerged from these encounters. North American Inuit legends suggest that the lights are the embodiment of spirits watching over Earth. Some claim they are the spirits of stillborn, while the Tlingit people of today's southern Alaska believe they are bringing bad omens when you look at them. Over in Europe, the Vikings enshrined the Aurora lights into their mythology, believing that the lights are a reflection off of the armor of the Valkyrie, the supernatural maidens who brought warriors into the afterlife. Many other cultures have hypothesized about the spectacle, and astronomical observations can be found in scriptures from a royal astronomer in ancient Babylon or China, Korea and Japan. While observations were frequent, scientific revelations regarding the matter remained sparse. The famous Galileo Galilei, who coined the term Aurora Borealis, for example, believed the lights to be reflections of the sun on Earth's atmosphere, despite the most common occurrence happening during nighttime. Since aurora lights are such a rare and unpredictable sight, and most commonly found in inhospitable polar regions, scientific discoveries were very slow, and it wasn't until 1790 that some advancements were made, identifying the height of the aurora lights to around 100 kilometers or 60 miles in the sky through the use of triangulation. The identification of the cause itself, however, had to wait another 100 years. In 1902, the Norwegian physicist Christian Birkeland theorized that the light occurs from beams of electrons, which were discovered just two years prior to his theory, excite the gases in the upper atmosphere, causing them to illuminate. During his lifetime, the theory couldn't be proven, and the British Royal Society dismissed him as a crank. Another 65 years later, however, the theories were finally proven when a US Navy satellite observed magnetic disturbance every time it passed the high latitude areas of the Earth, bringing us to chapter 2. What is the Aurora Borealis? Standing on Earth, the aurora lights seem like a peaceful and tranquil event with slowly moving, beautiful columns of light dancing in the atmosphere. In reality, however, it's quite a violent event with powerful forces clashing into each other. The so-called corona, or the upper atmosphere of our sun, continuously ejects countless free and charged particles, like electrons and protons from its gravitational field, which are being fired in all directions. Upon leaving the sun's atmosphere, they group in what is called solar winds to travel the void of space at unimaginable speeds. Earth is surrounded by a strong magnetic field which redirects the particles away from the surface. But every once in a while, an oversized solar wind is heading for Earth, overpowering the outer layers of the magnetic field. In these instances, the particles travel along the magnetic field, which inevitably directs them towards the poles. Upon entering Earth's atmosphere, the charged free protons and electrons now collide with the atmospheric atoms and molecules, releasing enormous amounts of energy in the form of light. Depending on which atom or molecule the particle collides with, they actually give off a distinct color. Nitrogen atoms, for example, produce a red hue, whereas oxygen hues in a green shade. Having these solar winds overcome the magnetic field is already a relatively rare feat, but this also implies that, at least theoretically, solar winds can hit any latitude on Earth. An exceptionally big solar storm, for example, created an aurora light as far south as Honduras in 1989, and with it also took out the electrical grid of Quebec in Canada. So since all it takes is the presence of a gaseous atmosphere and sufficiently fast particles crashing into it, aurora lights are not actually unique to Earth. Other planets in our solar system, such as Mars, Jupiter, and many gaseous moons are experiencing aurora lights, in many instances even brighter than ours due to different magnetic fields. 
The United Arab Emirates space program sent a Mars orbiter to inspect the atmosphere of our neighboring planet and upon arrival accidentally detected some of the most intense aurora lights which illuminated almost the entire daylight side of Mars. For many hobby astronomers and travelers, seeing the aurora lights with your own eyes is a top bucket list item. So to finish off the video, let's go through some of the things you need to keep in mind if you want to be one of the lucky ones. Chapter 3. How to see the Aurora Borealis. To start off, you don't actually need to be in the northern hemisphere to observe aurora lights. The magnetic field typically pushes equal amounts of charged particles to both poles. So observing the south pole sky may also yield some incredible pictures. The Borealis part of Aurora Borealis actually stands for the Greek god of the north winds, indicating that this term refers to the northern lights. The southern ones are actually called Aurora Australis, but in the end both are the same kind of spectacle. Trying your luck in the south poses one big problem however, which is that the aurora lights most frequently occur in the auroral zone, an approximately 2500 km or 1550 mile perimeter around the poles. In the north, this includes landmasses like the northern parts of Alaska, Canada, the entirety of Iceland, Svalbard and northern parts of Norway, Finland and Sweden. But in the south, this zone lays entirely over the Antarctic landmass and the southern ocean. Regardless of where you're traveling to in these areas, it is important to stay away from any light pollution source such as a city, as they can dim out the heavenly lights. And it is advised to be aware of the moon phases, since a full moon may also dim the shine of the aurora lights. Finally, while solar storms, which give off energetic solar winds, occur at any given moment, the intensity varies in a cyclical pattern. The cycle reaches its maximum intensity every 11 years, and with the last peak having occurred in 2014, the next prime time will be in 2025, so just around the corner. Despite all of this though, it's important to keep in mind that the auroral lights are very unpredictable. And despite you planning your trip the best you can, it is always a matter of luck. One tool you can use to increase your chances is the forecast from the University of Alaska, Fairbanks Geophysical Institute and NOAA, which allows you to look at the probability of northern lights for up to three days into the future. A link to which will be in the description. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new about the intricate mechanics of our universe. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you want to see more like this video. Cheers.